thank you for coming uh, to the last panel of the day, Commercial Space in the 21st Century Issues and Actors. My name is Joanne Gabrinowitz. Uh, I have been teaching space law since 1987. Uh, and my co-panelists are Kevin Lippert and Pablo Nichols. And um, Kevin is, uh, manages Viasat's legal department. And Pablo Nichols is an associate in Morrison and Forrester's San Francisco office. They have very formidable bios, which I will, um, I have their permission to direct you to rather than read them because I think we would all rather listen to them than listen to me talk about them. And uh, I was asked, first of all, I want to thank David Kane for inviting me to do this. And uh, I've uh, enjoyed today so far. I'm also acutely aware of the fact that the three of us stand between you and cocktails. So um, <laughs> we, will, we will be mindful of our time. And uh, David asked me uh, to uh, give some highlights of space law, since it's a subject that he thought would be new to most people who are attending this con uh, conference. And then each of my co-panelists are going to be addressing more specific, in-depth areas of that. So let me just start with 20th century space. In the beginning, there was Sputnik and it went into orbit on October 4th, 1957. And in this day and age of uh, iPods and uh, internet, and we have uh, children and students who are totally wired all of the time, it's hard for them to understand why that little tiny metal ball was so terrifying. And that little metal t ball was terrifying, not in and of itself, which was a benign scientific experiment, but because of the launch vehicle that placed it in space. The launch vehicle represented the capability to send nuclear weapons in through space and then have them land elsewhere on the planet. That is what was scary. At the time, the only governments that were involved, and it was only governments <coughs> that were involved, were the former Soviet Union and uh, the United States. Uh, the issues that they had to address was preventing nuclear weapons in space, preventing nuclear weapons in space, <laughs> preventing nuclear weapons in space, and oh, did I mention preventing nuclear weapons in space. That was what got them to the uh, bargaining table. Just a few years prior to 1957, the mushroom cloud that's on the image there was in everybody's mind after Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the idea of nuclear weapons raining down from space <clears throat> was not, no longer science fiction. So the US deployed a very specific strategy in response to this, and that was to promulgate law. Like I like to tell my students that when human beings, <clears throat> excuse me, when human beings have conflict, they can only do two things. They can either fight about it or reach agreement. Even if they agree to agree, that's just putting it off. And at the level of nations, either fighting or agreement means law or war. And so here, the decision was made that we would promulgate law to address this uh, crisis. And uh, the United States strategy included law that would uh, contain US values and constrain uh, the um, growing use of nuclear weapons. At the national level, that meant uh, promulgating the 1958 National Aeronautics and Space Act, and it was not by accident. It entered into force on October 4th, 1958, one year to the day after Sputnik, and that in and of itself was a message. At the international level, an entire treaty regime was put into place. Uh, I won't explain all of these treaties other than the Outer Space Treaty, which is incredibly important. We would not get that treaty today. And it functions like a constitution for space. And that's why when you go through international space law and US national space law, you will find mutual terms of art, including things like peaceful purposes. This was intentional. 
So in the last half of the 20th century, we see uh, the number of actors growing in space. And there's a list that's not complete, but it is uh, uh, very near complete. And in addition to nation states, we see intergovernmental organizations becoming active in space. Perhaps uh, the most important and continued is the European Space Agency. Uh, intergovernmental organizations were entities that were being created in a lot of areas for a lot of reasons in the last quarter of the 20th century, and that certainly included space. And companies, uh, uh, individual um, companies, both in the United States and in other countries, uh, began to become active in space. Other important issues, in addition to the uh, nuclear weapons, was um, the appropriation of space. No nation can appropriate space. Nation states and non-governmental entities are both proper actors in space. This is an interesting provision because the uh, Soviet Union took the position that only states were appropriate actors. And of course, the United States uh, took the position that even the private sector uh, is uh, a, an appropriate actor. And this is the compromise between those two positions. A liability regime was established. Strict liability applies to events in space, and negligence applies to um, harm caused on Earth and to aircraft in flight, by the way. All nations have the non-exclusive right to use and explore space, use and explore are terms of art in the treaties. And in the United States, we see that space law follows technology and geopolitics. And so in the, 50, in the 50s, we addressed uh, the exigencies of the Civil War, 1962, satellite telecommunications. In the 80s, we see that commercial space is added as a third independent sector to civil space and military space. 80s and 90s, uh, different applications, launch vehicles, earth observations, remote sensing, navigation. And in the 2000s, what we see is a, a refinement of regulations. And in 2010, and this is the biggie, in 2010, the US Congress added a new title to the United States Code for National and Commercial Space Programs. It was the first time in 83 years that a new title was added to the US code, and it was for space. So fast forward to now. Who are the actors? We still have governments. Uh, they are same as previously mentioned, and the number continues to grow. We still have intergovernmental organizations, but a lot of them have been privatized. One of them in the news today with the Malaysian um, Aircraft is in MARSAT, stands for International um, Maritime Satellite Organization, uh, does rescue uh, in uh, different parts of the world, re uh, data for rescue in different parts of the world. But what we have now that we didn't have then is what's being referred to as the new space companies. Uh, as they join the legacy companies. So companies like SpaceX and Bigelow, uh, these are uh, planetary resources. These are new companies that are adding, uh, becoming present in addition to the, the giants that we all know about, uh, Lockheed's and the Boeing's. In the United States, an interesting wrinkle is that individual states are now promulgating space law at the state level. And this is being catalyzed by the development of spaceports in various uh, states. And spaceports are being catalyzed based on uh, the belief that there will be commercial value in commercial space activities, and it would be beneficial for an individual state. And states that have pre-existing facilities, for example, Virginia with Wallops Island. And so we do have state law, and that's going to introduce a whole lot of interesting issues, including preemption at some point. What's really interesting is until the 2000s, the United States and uh, the Russian Republic were really one among the only nations that had space law at the national level. And that took off in the 2000s. And you have 
countries that are very prominent and very respectable spacefaring nations for a very long time, only for the first time promulgating law at the national level in the 2000s, and that includes Canada, France, Germany, and Japan. There's a list of nations here who now have national space laws, and depending on your definition of spacefaring, the law is uh, designed in those countries to address the activities that they engage in. What are the issues? We still have many of the same issues, the licensing and registration questions. Uh, an interesting issue is the transfer of title on orbit. So if company A owns a communication satellite and sells it to company B and title transfers, there's a whole bundle of issues that goes with that title transfer. The allocation of orbital slots, and one of our speakers knows a whole lot more about that than I do, and I know he's going to address that. Some of the new issues, orbital debris, environment. There is so much stuff up there. Uh, these objects travel at 17,000 miles an hour, and at that speed, you don't need a lot of mass to do a lot of damage. And they hit one another, and they um, uh, propagate like crazy up there. And uh, we have reached a point where we, in fact, have collisions, and it's something we need to be concerned about. Private and commercial activities are growing, as was mentioned in the previous panel. I'll come back to that in a second. Off-Earth resource extraction. Uh, there's questions about mining asteroids, lunar bases. Uh, what are the property rights implications of that? Um, also, constellations of satellites, not just individual satellites. Constellations raise different issues, including, um, in some cases, people trying to uh, patent orbits. The one issue I want to hone in on is the definition of commercial, because this is very important in aerospace, and it's very important uh, both in the United States and in other countries. In the US, we define commercial based on who is doing it. By and large, if we say something is commercial, that means the private sector does it. In general, and there are exceptions, but in general, the government does not engage in commerce. The United States is in the vast minority of that definition. And most of the rest of the world, including industrialized democracies, they look at generating revenue. If an activity generates revenue, it's commercial, and it doesn't matter who does it. Governments can engage in commercial activities. And in some cases, the government is the market. Um, and that's true in Canada, Europe, Japan, France, other countries. And this is important to keep in mind because the debate about leveling the playing field has not gone away. It's my professional opinion it will never go away because the people who define, the, the nations that define uh, commercial as generating revenue is not going to change their mind and the United States doesn't appear to be changing its mind. Uh, there is some discussion though. I mean, when it's held out that the US um, defines commercial as private sector, the argument back is yes, but there's such a heavily subsidized aerospace industry in the United States that that is analogous to what goes on in other countries. I'll leave that to you to discuss. One of the questions is, new, are these new space companies changing this? And when you see that the new space companies are at least initially providing goods and services to the government, getting to and from the space station, for example, uh, this debate is going to continue and it's not going to go away. It's important for you as lawyers to know about this, though, because when the word commercial is used in a document, you better know which version they're using, because that may speak to what your client will be able to do or not do. Also, in the growing era of public-private partnerships, what are those? And what is your starting point for commercial in those partnerships? This is an unabashed commercial. If you would like to know more about the evolution of US space law, there's a citation for an article I published a few years ago. And with that, I will say thank you. We'll take questions after my colleagues speak. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Kevin Lippert, 
when I agreed to uh, do this panel, I thought it was going to be cocktail hour. Um, <laughs> uh, just to give you a little bit of background, um, work at Viasat, general. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, general counsel of Viasat, been there about 14 years. Uh, my first uh, six or so years there, background mostly doing corporate law. Our CEO walks into my office one afternoon and says, uh, Kevin, I think I want to build a satellite. And uh, so I, I called up one of our outside counsel and I said, is there like a satellite for dummies book I can read? Um, he, he said no. Um, so I've been asking a lot of questions and learning about this since. So uh, uh, that, that's how I uh, got into uh, space law. Um, and uh, at this point, you know, we were uh, mostly a commercial company. We do a lot of government stuff as well and uh, you know, operate uh, three satellites and have, uh, have one more we're building on the way. So um, with that, I'll, I'll get started. Uh, you know, probably could sit here and talk for a week about all the different issues in space law. My presentation is a little skewed to uh, some of the issues that I face and uh, we think about um, at, at our company, not necessarily about our company though. So um, with that, I guess I'll go to the first slide. So this is just, uh, my sense of kind of where things are at today from, from, uh, you know, from a commercial satellite operator's perspective. Lots of different satellites being launched every year at this point. Uh, you know, most of them are smaller satellites, uh, but there's probably 10 to 20 um, you know, large geo satellites being launched a year. Um, you know, it's helping companies like SpaceX uh, you know, getting, getting more launch availability. Oh, I'm sorry. Geo is a geosynchronous orbit. That's essentially a satellite that essentially stays over the same part of the Earth as the Earth rotates. Um, I'm going to talk a little about, uh, you'll see an NGSO satellite is a non-GSO, so generally that uh, rotates or orbits around the Earth faster than, uh, um, than the Earth rotates. I actually have a picture, so I'll just jump ahead. So this is a, a picture I stole from somebody on, on the internet, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> So you, it just sort of gives you a sense, and so you know, if you were to pick one of the satellites up there, as the Earth rotates, it essentially stays in the same place, and all, this, all these geosatellites are essentially along the equator above the Earth. Um, so you can, you can see it's, it's quite a few satellites. Uh, the different colors depict uh, different frequencies uh, that the, uh, the satellites are at. So um, that's just sort of a sense of the geo um, satellites. You know, certain, certain sectors, uh, satellites are developing, technology is developing pretty rapidly, I think. Um, you know, if you, if you went back to the 1960s, 1970s, you probably would say that the government uh, satellite systems were sort of leading edge. Uh, at this point, I think commercial satellites are, are probably leading edge. That's, I think that's why the government's using a lot of uh, commercial satellites at this point. Uh, satellites now are getting over 100 gigabits per second. Uh, per satellite will probably be a couple of years over 200 gigabits per second. Um, you have also have the interesting development of these uh, little microsats, you know, satellites probably as big as my computer. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the interesting legal issues around that. Um, and satellites are deploying into, into new frequencies. I mean, these frequencies have obviously been available, but they're generally higher and higher. Uh, K band, V band, people are becoming more interested in. Uh, those are just different. You can sort of think of frequencies, the extent people don't understand that is just it's sort of like just different, uh, same, it works the same way as a radio station, you know, different frequencies, um, uh, different, different uh, frequencies on satellites, just like different frequencies on your radio. Um, also, you guys, uh, people may have heard um, some of the stuff that's going on ATC, you know, satellite terrestrial frequency sharing issues, people may have heard about light squared, you know, had this you know, granted uh, use of their satellite spectrum for terrestrial purposes, and then the FCC reversed themselves, and uh, you know, it's been it's been a, a pretty big fight. So there's, those are some issues there we'll talk about. And uh, you know, governments have become more interested in funding you know commercial uh, communication technologies and services, uh, which is interesting, uh, and and definitely impacts the industry. So that that's kind of the environment. I. I uh, you know, some, some people refer to space as the new frontier. I, I like to refer to it as hostile work environment. Um, because in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, there are a lot of issues and they're, they're very difficult to parse through. Um, you know, you're oftentimes dealing with uh, different countries and different politicians and, and um, you know, that, that can be uh, uh, quite a challenge. So, you know, one of, one of the 
One of the main challenges we have, and I see a lot of companies facing, is orbital slot availability. So if you go back to the, you know, to the slide right here, every one of these satellites is in a different, you know, we call it slot over the Earth. And generally, there's two degree spacing between each satellite. It doesn't, you know, it seems like a lot, but you know, if you were to look at the United States, you probably would say, you know, the only slots that are good for covering the United States would probably be from like, let's say, 70 degrees to let's say 130 degrees. So two degree spacing, um, you know, that would you know, that only leaves you with. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna do the math real quick. Is that 30 slots? Yeah, 30 slots. So there's not a lot of not a lot of availability uh, for satellites. Um, the other issues there are, you know, at the ITU, uh, people are filing a lot of different countries. Uh, these are all country filings for on behalf of uh, commercial companies. A lot of paper satellite filings, hundreds of hundreds of satellite filings a year, you know, and a very very small percentage of, of those filings are actually uh, being actually developed. And so there's a crowded um, field. And it's very, very difficult to parse through that to actually have certainty that you're, when you're going to launch your satellite, that actually you're going to have availability at that slot because there's so many of these, uh, you know, fake satellites essentially um, in front of you. So that makes it very difficult. Um, and then there's, you know, land grab at new frequencies. People moving satellites around, um, trying to park satellites in, in certain orbital slots um, for, for future development. One of the other big issues uh, that we face is, uh, you know, the U.S. government um, a few years ago went through some licensing reform and made it essentially, imp hopefully there's nobody from the FCC here, made it essentially impossible for U.S. operators to, um, from my perspective, to, uh, to effectively use the U.S. government to do orbital slot filing. So essentially all the U.S. operators have moved offshore to do um, all of their orbital slot filing. So all of our satellites going forward will be UK satellites um, or other country satellites, which is a little embarrassing to me, but um, uh, that's kind of where we're at. Um, and it, it definitely makes it difficult. I have, I have some funny stories about that if anyone wants to talk about them afterwards. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was telling uh, Joanne earlier that, um, you know, sometimes when I'm dealing with these governments, I feel like I'm uh, Secretary of State trying to get the US government and the UK government to come to agreements. Uh, so uh, it's not necessarily just being a good lawyer, it's sometimes being a good politician, I'm not sure. Diplomat. Diplomat, I guess, is a better word, yes. Uh, and, and because uh, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the US companies are moving offshore, the US government has become more interested in changing their rules to get more control over the satellites that are operating in the, with access into the US, even though those, those uh, satellites aren't actually US satellites. So there's sort of a little bit of a regulatory creep going on uh, because they're feeling a little left out, and uh, you know, regulators like to regulate. So um, that having to deal with uh, an evolving rule base, I guess, is a nice way to say it. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, go the governments are, are are becoming more and more involved in in funding and developing uh, commercial uh, satellite systems. NBN, which is an Australian system, they're spending a couple billion dollars putting up a couple satellites, uh, laying infrastructure to. Uh, as part of their uh, development of their um, broadband systems in Australia and then here in the US. Um, I don't know if you look at your phone bill, everyone has this universal service fee on your phone bill. Essentially the government's taking that money and now they're gonna use it instead of providing service to people that otherwise wouldn't have it to live out in the, you know, the woods and rural areas uh, and now using that for, for broadband as well, not just telephone service, so. And you know, one of the interesting, this is, uh, I tried to, Coin a new term here. I don't know if it'll stick or not, but uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, types of systems that we were talking about earlier are these what we call Leo systems, which are you know low Earth orbit systems. So when you go on Google Earth and you see a picture of the Earth, those are taken with low Earth orbit you know digital uh, imaging satellites, and those are you know hundreds of miles or 100 miles. Someone probably in here knows uh, above the Earth, so they're not very far above the Earth, um, and those are, tend to be smaller satellites, but now what's being developed are, like I said earlier, these little microsats, and they're really not much bigger than my laptop. And, and uh, you know, companies like Virgin uh, Atlantic or uh, Virgin Space, I can't remember the exact name, is talking about launching those type of uh, uh, satellites as part of their you know, space tours, uh, which is another interesting area of space law, which you know, it's not really any, not really any laws around. So that, that'll be an interesting thing. And then, we, and then you talk, you tie in, 
to that, these orbital debris problems that you have, and now you have all these little microsats up there, and who's regulating um, the orbital debris, and is that problem going to get worse? And certainly uh, something we think about as we try to figure out how we're going to invest our, our money going forward into what type of systems. And then, you know, we talked earlier about uh, emergency frequencies, K band, V band. A lot of times when you put these frequencies on your satellite, there are no rules in a lot of the countries that you're, you're trying to operate in in terms of regulating uh, services and those frequencies or regulating equipment using those frequencies. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes it's country by country knocking them off, uh, trying, to get, trying to get regulatory approval. Um, which, which makes, uh, you know, makes it interesting. There's obviously some bodies, regulatory bodies that we try to get involved in that you know, can, can act as uh, standards um, if you're able to uh, persuade them. And then you have emergency services, uh, um, emergency services. Uh, you know, in-flight Wi-Fi is gonna be a big, um, uh, I think, service area for satellites in, in the um, near future and, and even today a little bit. And uh, you know, there's there's not a lot of rules around that. So the, those rules are all being developed right now. Um, you know, and it's it's uh, you know, d governments move slowly, and so when you're offering these emerging services, and you know, time to market's really important. Uh, you know, governments governments uh, aren't always cooperative in terms of uh, you know meeting your deadlines um, to make sure that you're keeping your you know time to market advantage. Uh, talked a little bit about ATC. Um, light square reversal, you know, that's disconcerting for a lot of people because, uh, you know, again, it's just sort of an emerging technology, emerging service. There's not a lot of rules around it. People spend billions of dollars. They think they're going to get, uh, you know, service and then, you know, it gets reversed. Um, so even though, obviously, uh, you know, I don't, I don't work there, it still makes me nervous when you see the government uh, reversing decisions uh, that, that are impacting uh, billions of dollars of investment. Um, so regulatory certainty um, isn't always there in the satellite world, space law. When you're, you know, when you're, uh, when you're on the merging, uh, you know, using emerging technologies. Uh, another example that something that's coming up that's being written right now is, uh, you know, uh, they call it air to ground. It's basically using uh, satellite uh, frequencies for um, an air to ground system for in-flight Wi-Fi. Uh, Qualcomm, local company here, is, is one of the supporters of that, and. And uh, you know we're 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 going to probably be involved in that as well. Um, so I think I covered the uh, Leo orbital debris impact already um, issue. So that that's that's all I had for today. Thank you. All right, thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, recent developments in commercial space, specifically you know launching uh, rockets and cargo and. Uh, astronauts and then turn to a discussion of bid protests, uh, which are a crucial tool with which companies can use to defend and obtain government contracts. Uh, recent developments in the commercialization of the, the launch industry can be largely tied to the Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy and the winding down of the shuttle program. Uh, without an active program, NASA lacked the launch capability to meet its needs and it was forced to turn to non-US launch companies for satellites and other needs, largely Russian companies. Uh, and this, uh, in turn, basically the US taxpayer was funding the development of Chinese, the Russians, and others. So NASA, in my view, and this is my view, I'm not speaking for any of my clients or the firm, uh, wisely decided that seeding space and our abilities in space to non-US companies was not a good idea. Uh, in the early aughts, around I think 03, 05, the vision for space exploration in the last administration and the Constellation program, as well in 06, the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program, uh, or COTS, these were all in many ways an attempt to reboot American investment in launch capability and space travel. Uh, the vision sought to uh, initiate a new period of investment in space travel exploration and manned missions to the moon. Some of you may remember this in the press uh, and Mars thereafter, as well as the asteroids. Uh, the Constellation program was the human spaceflight component of the vision. Uh, in 06, the COTS program was created to assist commercial development of new vehicles and to provide cargo and astronauts to the International Space Station. Two COTS contracts were awarded by NASA, first to SpaceX 
in 06, and second to Orbital Sciences Corp in 08. Uh, from 06 to 12, I believe there was $800 million in funding to these two contractors to help them develop their in industry cargo space capabilities. Uh, COTS is largely seen by NASA as a huge success. I think there was a big conference maybe a month ago or so where NASA came out and announced this. Uh, both SpaceX and Orbital have successfully completed uh, flights to the space station. Um, unlike COTS, Constellation didn't fare quite as well. Uh, by 2010, it faced serious budget overruns. And ultimately, the administration decided to move from a traditional and what some would say more costly approach in which NASA bought and paid for rockets and capsules from a single provider, one of the legacy providers, to a more of a public-private partnership model in which NASA invested in the capabilities of several companies, uh, allowed them to use their innovative commercial techniques, and paid for only those flights for which NASA had a legitimate need. Essentially, the government was betting that private companies could perform some of the core functions of NASA at a lower price. And while this is all still in development, it's still emerging, the jury's still out on this, and we're starting to see some evidence that NASA may have been right. Uh, still, the, the old model is still, still there, and that survives in the space launch system, which is the progeny of the Constellation program. Uh, under this program, NASA is contracted with Boeing to develop a heavy launch vehicle for crew and cargo designed to travel to the moon, Mars, and the asteroid belt. I think the first uh, test flight for that is scheduled for 2017 right now, but I'm not sure. Uh, this program, like I said before, has been somewhat costly. I th believe the cost is estimated at roughly $18 billion through 2017, uh, but that's it is what it is. Uh, let's see. Commercial resupply services contracts are the follow-on to COTS. Under these, NASA paid or pays commercial providers to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. Essentially, NASA uh, sets out broad service goals and lets each company use their own unique technical capabilities to meet those goals. Requirements and specifications and a lot of the detailed things that you see in a government contract are only included, and much less than these, and they're only included when needed for safety or ISS certification. Uh, in 2008, NASA awarded a $1.6 billion CRS contract to SpaceX for 12 flights and a $1.9 billion contract to Orbital for eight flights. These are still ongoing now and they continue through 2016. Like COTS, uh, CRS has to date been pretty successful by most measures. SpaceX perf has performed the first of its flights and uh, in doing so made history by becoming the first private spacecraft to deliver cargo to the International Space Station and return safely to Earth. Uh, while this is, all, this is all centered on cargo at this point, uh, plans and designs are in development to take astronauts within the next few years. I believe there's some test flights that are going on now. Thank you. So this turns to the astronaut side of it. In addition to uh, transporting cargo, NASA's engaging commercial contractors to, these are two pictures of two of the capsules from SpaceX and from Orbital. These are part of the CRS contracts. Uh, commercial contractors to transport true crew to the International Space Station under commercial crew integrated capability contracts. This is a multi-phase contract with ongoing milestone funding. Meet certain things, you're gonna get more funding, meet certain milestones. $1.6 billion under phase three. There have been awards to SpaceX, Boeing, and Sierra Nevada. Phase four awards are due out this summer, I believe. Uh, and NASA, in, in phase four, NASA will fund construction and certification of new spacecraft and potentially issue task orders. And NASA hasn't yet decided, I believe, whether they will make one or two awards under this, under this phase four, uh, but you can, you can bet that whichever what they do, one of the three phase three as well as others will, will be fighting that. All of these types of agreements are made possible by the Space Act agreements in National Aeronautics and Space Act of 1958. Uh, Space Act agreements are designed to allow contractors to enable maximum use of their cost-effective commercial practices. 
uh, by teaming with commercial partners, NASA can enhance its capabilities, engage with the public and industry, and support its core missions at a low cost to the taxpayer. I believe there's roughly 250 new Space Act agreements coming out every year, so they're pretty common. Uh, I'll skip over reimbursable, non-reimbursable funded for those of you they're interested, we could talk later. And generally, more favorable terms on things like IP retention for the contractor, termination rights are lower for the government. So it's generally a more favored approach for contractors than going on a, num a normal procurement under the FAR. All right, turning to bid protests, uh, I'd like to focus a little on how companies can use the bid protest process to acquire a greater share of the market in the emerging space industry. This is kind of instrumental uh, in this competitive marketplace. A bid protest, for those of you that don't know, is a legal challenge to a contract award or to the terms of a solicitation before the award has been made. Uh, bid protests have become an increasingly popular tool for when contracted with the federal government, and there's roughly 3,000 bid protests filed every year at GAO, the Government Accountability Office, and another 100 or so filed at the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Bid protests have been on the rise for most of the last decade for largely for two reasons. One, the marketplace is extremely competitive. And two, many of these government contracts can last for five to 10 years. So being shut out of a market uh, for a 10-year contract and allowing that to go to one of your competitors for two or three or four billion dollars simply is not doable for most companies. So they will fight this. So who can file a bid protest if you lose an award? Generally interested parties. Interested parties are actual or prospective offerors whose economic interest will be affected by the challenged agency action. So if you submit a proposal, you believe the agency awarded the contract improperly to your competitor, perhaps you think that the competitor was not qualified, they lacked certain IP that was necessary to perform, they lacked certain experience in their key personnel. So long as you submit a proposal, you can file a protest. If you don't submit a proposal, and then you later complain when you find out that the awardee did not have certain IP rights or did not have certain experience. Too late. You're no longer an interested party. So you've got to participate to play. Uh, bid protests under the Competition and Contracting Act and the Tucker Act are filed, like I said, at GAO and the Court of Federal Claims. One of the advantages of filing a GAO and the reason why there are 3,000, two, two reasons why there are 3,000 at GAO versus the court, is that if you timely file a GAO by statute, you stop the process. The awardee cannot perform for 100 days unless the agency issues an override, which is very rare. Less than 5% of the time, probably less than 2% of the time, you'll see an override. So many times you'll see incumbents uh, use this 100-day stay provision to their advantage. We had a client that would, had been performing a contract for five years. The follow-on came in 2011, was awarded to somebody else. We filed a protest. We won. The agency took two and a half years to reevaluate proposals and issue a new award. So they got two and a half years of extra contract performance. And we filed a protest again last three weeks ago when we lost again. And hopefully we can get two more years out of that. So it is a tactic thing. If you're the incumbent, you, uh, you can use it to your advantage. Uh, timeliness, because bid protests can disrupt the government's ability to obtain necessary goods and services. <coughs> Uh, the rules require companies to complain quickly or not at all. At GAO, you've got 10 days from the date at which you knew or should have known of the basis of protest. At the Court of Federal Claims, it's a little bit more lax. They don't have the 10-day rule, but they apply the common law rule of latches. Uh, but it's effectively the same. If you unduly delay in filing your claim, it will be too late. Uh, we'll skip over protective orders in the interest of time. Um, but I would like to point out the standard of review. This is a very deferential standard of review in a bid protest. The court nor GAO is going to second guess the evaluation judgment of evaluators. If you think that you deserve an excellence for your technical capability and the agency awarded you a good rating instead of an excellent and you go in there and you complain, you're, they're not going to care. They're not going to listen. You're much more likely to prevail on procedural issues. So for example, if the solicitation required the agency to evaluate whether prices were unre unrealistically low or imbalanced or anything like that, and you can show based, off the, based on the record that the agency did not conduct that analysis, you will win. Finally, two quick case studies. 
the first is a pre-award protest, and in, in the interest of full disclosure, we represented SpaceX on this case. Uh, it, but it provides a good example of how competitors can use the pre-award protest to try and gain a competitive advantage. In this case, Blue Origin filed the bid protest and they were unsuccessful, but still it shows you how it can be done. Uh, launch site 39A, which I believe you can see here on this map, at the Kennedy Space Center was used by NASA throughout the Apollo and shuttle programs. With the end of those programs, NASA had some very prime real estate for launch companies on its hands, and NASA had no budget to maintain or operate it, nothing to do with it, because the shuttle program was being discontinued. Rather than let the site rust and fall into the Atlantic Ocean, NASA used its Space Act authority to solicit proposals to lease the site for an unspecified number of years. I think it might have ended up becoming 20, a 20 year lease. The lessee would be permitted to use the launch site and in exchange, they would have to assume all financial and technical responsibility to operate and maintain the site. Uh, the solicitation contemplated two possible types of leases, either an exclusive loose use lease where the company said we're only gonna use, launch our rockets from this site or a multi-use user lease, where they basically said, we'll take any launch provider that wants to use it, they could rent it out for a month or two months or whatever the case may be, and we'll let everybody share. Two prospective lessees, SpaceX and Blue Origin. SpaceX proposed to use the site exclusively for its Falcon line of rockets for government commercial customers. Blue Origin proposed to operate it as a multi-user launch site with companies such as the United Launch Alliance, uh, the JV between Boeing and Lockheed, would be permitted to share the site with Blue Origin and anyone else. Blue Origin filed this pre-award protest, uh, arguing that the solicitation's terms contained language that implied that NASA had to award the lease to anybody that offered a multi-user approach before anybody that offered exclusive use of exclusive use approach. So according to Blue Origin, because there was only one of each, they won. Uh, GEO was not convinced, and NASA was not convinced. NASA said that was basically absurd. Uh, and GEO found that the, the solicitation did not favor either approach, but simply asked for information from both operators so that NASA could assess which one would allow NASA to achieve its core mission of ensuring the awardee would make use of LC-39A in, quote, a manner that supports the fullest commercial use of space. So basically NASA said, you can be an exclusive use provider and if you've got a manifest that's got launches every month, that's, that's you know, that, that might be better than a multi-user who's gonna have to switch people in and out and may only get three or four launches because of the difficulty in rearranging the site. Uh, one day after GEO's decision, NASA awarded the lease to SpaceX, so they are now the lessee at LC-39A. We'll skip the second one. If you'd like to talk about human health and performance contracts, uh, we could talk about it after or in questions. Uh, but basically, in short, there's two offerors competing for a $1.76 billion 10-year contract. And these guys are fighting. It's still ongoing. First protest, Wild Labs won the protest. Second one came, sorry, the first one's SAIC won. Second one, Wild Labs won. They're still going around and around. These two are not gonna stop because of the importance of the contract to both companies. All right, so last slide. Uh, so what does the future hold? Uh, five quick points. First, a continued focus on public-private partnerships in this area, uh, supporting NASA missions in a cost-efficient manner. Uh, second, I think we're gonna see increased focus by launch providers on commercial operations. Uh, transporting broadcasting and communications network satellites for both domestic and international customers. Third, I think we're gonna see increased demand in the international market, uh, as well as increased supply, as we're starting to see more and more competition from company launch providers in Japan and India and China. So it's not just the US anymore. Fourth, a potentially game-changing, and, and maybe somewhat biased, technological development is SpaceX's grasshopper which essentially is a reusable rocket. The metaphor that you've probably heard in the press is uh, you know, imagine how expensive an airplane flight would be if you had to throw away the Boeing 747 every time you flew from LA to New York. It'd be prohibitive. So SpaceX is developing technology that would allow them to recover their rockets and reuse them again. Hopefully that will work out and we will see a 
exponential decrease in the cost. And then finally, we shouldn't forget the space launch system, which uh, is our current best hope at travel to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Thank you. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the light square uh, fiasco. Yeah. Uh, and they died a, a, a death after the delay. It's great. And the bankrupt. My question to you is: is is the danger still there of that happening again? I, I mean, I think it's non-technical government regulators in charge of science-based topics. But I mean, so is that just inherent to in the process, or was that an anomaly and it won't happen again? I mean, what's your what's your fear? Could you outline it better? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that kind of stuff keeps me up at night, for sure. I think it will happen again. Um, I, I agree that, you know, sometimes you have the technologies moving so, so quickly that the regulators just can't keep up in terms of whether it's light squared or whether it's, you know, in-flight Wi-Fi. And there's all these issues. I mean, there's, you, know, you talk about even in-flight Wi-Fi, you know, now you have, like, weird privacy issues. Um, you know, someone's on the plane, they're doing a Skype video, and the person behind them is on the video now, you know, and so there, there's, there's all sorts of uh, um, uh, difficult issues, and it's, it's really difficult for anyone to keep up with, especially regulators who really aren't um, necessarily seeing things until they, until they come to them. So, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, it's, it, it worries me, and I think you know, from, from our perspective, we just try to be really diligent and make sure that the regulators really understand this stuff and we try to get out ahead of it and meet with them, you know, uh, years ahead of time. And we're, we're meeting with them on technologies that are going to be launching in five years from now and just familiarizing them and making sure they understand how it changes the world. Sometimes they don't believe us that we're going to be able to do these things, but. Uh, um, you know, that, that's, that's um, all you can do, I think. OK, the gentleman back here. Is there any way to clean up the space junk issue? Uh, who, me? <laughs> the, OK. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you have to, um, when you talk about orbital debris, you have to talk about where is it. Because where it is depends on what the options are. So uh, orbital debris can be anything from broken pieces to fully formed but defunct satellites. And if you have that kind of debris in uh, geosynchronous orbit, it's much harder to get to. So one of the things that's happening now is the FCC is requiring license applicants to uh, an applicant who wants to, uh, a license to place a satellite in geosynchronous. One of the things they have to do in their plan is give an end of life plan for the satellite. In other words, what are you going to do when your satellite is no longer functioning? And it, that typically is around something like saving a little bit of fuel to boost it up uh, and to get it out of the orbit so the slot is open. Does that deal with debris, or does it just push it down a couple of hundred years and it's somebody else's problem? That's one issue. In low Earth orbit, uh, you have the benefit of physics on your side, because every 11 years, the sun goes into what's called solar max, which heats up the Earth's atmosphere, causes it to expand. And it will grab a lot of the debris in lower Earth orbit, say two to 400 miles above the, uh, the Earth. And that will cause it to burn in. And that's kind of a self-cleaning process. But the faster this stuff propagates, the more difficult it is. So what's happening as a practical matter is satellite designers are designing satellites differently so they don't break up as easily. In other words, you try to prevent or mitigate, because right now you can't go clean up. I think uh, just to just a real quick comment, I think you can think of it like cleaning up the oceans. I mean, it can be done. It's going to be really expensive. Who's going to do it? You know, um, No one owns space, as we talked about before. So who's going to spend the billions of dollars to clean it up? You know, And then Part of it is going to be too, is if you know, if if uh, countries keep blowing up satellites in low Earth orbit. I think I can't remember. I read like 25 percent or some some very large percentage of the debris that's in low Earth orbit is from the Chinese blowing up their 
their low Earth orbit satellite. So there's so there's a lot of different factors there. I, I think it's a really difficult problem. Well, for the record, most of the debris that is in space was created either by the former Soviet Union, the United States, or currently Russia. When China did its ASAT test, which means it shot down one of its own defunct weather satellites, it caused an enormous amount of uh, debris because it was at a very high orbit. And that is a problem. Yes, sir. So if I understand your question, and I'm paraphr paraphrasing, is um, if debris is a problem for everybody, why don't we do something about it? Right. OK. Uh, there is currently in the legal subcommittee of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space a draft principle for environmental uh, principles for the use of space. And what most countries are saying is, we didn't put the garbage there. Why should we pay to clean it up? Because it is mostly US, Soviet Union, and Russia. And so you have other spacefaring nations and non-spacefaring industrialized nations who say, we don't need to pay for this. Uh, the guidelines, yes, they're not legally binding, but they have been put together by nations that have the technological um, uh, knowledge about it, and they're pretty solid guidelines. And the idea is you get more with honey than you get with vinegar. And uh, if you have the guidelines out there, and they have the credibility of having been made by nations that know how to do this, perhaps you can influence uh, other countries to do something when they are not willing. And some of the, some of the newer entrant nations, are they relying mostly on the kind of bigger players and the space-faring nations to provide them with the technologies? It's not that organized. <laughs> it's, it's a highly, highly political environment. And um, it changes from time to time. And by and large, you will see the divides of the arguments go between the technologically advanced spacefaring nations and the non-technologically advanced non-spacefaring nations. Although there have been shifts, because you now have countries that used to be considered developing countries with satellite capability, like uh, Nigeria comes to mind. And so uh, that dichotomy is not what it once was either. So anybody else? Do you have anything you want to add to wrap up? Yeah, um, you know, I think, you know, if, if anyone here is interested in getting into space law, I, it's definitely interesting and, you know, it changes every day. Um, you know, the technologies are changing, the, um, uh, you know, sometimes you make relationships with people in government. Governments obviously have people that are changing and, uh, you know, I find it very exciting. Definitely is not boring. Um, you know, I have my own jaded views on, uh, on the ITU and the UN, um, but uh, you know, I, I definitely enjoy it, and it's it's uh, you know I'm lucky. I, I feel lucky I'm able to practice this here in San Diego as well. So, and I just want to point out to the students in the audience, no matter how exciting and glitzy space law may sound, the two practitioners were talking about contracts, and torts, and telecommunications. So the basics are still very very much what you need. Do you have something you'd like to add? Government contracts is very sexy. Don't let her dissuade me. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we will head out for cocktails. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>